we had a very wonderful uh, presentation of uh, ego pat and force approach by professor ricardo next we will be moving on to the next lecture on uh, anti like clinoid meningioma by professor amin kasam i welcome amin kasam on behalf of the organizers and the delegates to the uh, this morning session welcome amin kasam thank you um w was that an incredible talk by rick it uh, just in you know I, i still learn so much it's it's every time we go to a course the one talk i always show up for is uh, rick's transterogoid talk just phenomenal on anatomy um dr j asked me to kind of change the topic a little bit last night what he wanted me to do is to provide you with a a brief summary we're going to talk about 360 instead with the focus on the coronal plane we're going to try and take what danny's shown you yesterday some of the things that i tried to show you and what rick has gone over and let's try and apply that to clinical applications and do some cases together is that okay so this will be more of a practical discussion and we'll found some anatomy around it um that's my son for those of you that don't know him let's see if i can get this to go okay so if you ask us what the lessons that we've really learned in the last 10 years and the first experience it's really this concept of corridor surgery creating different distinct pathways into the ventral skull base using an exterior corridor like we talked about yesterday which is really your incisions and facial translocations the variety of different approaches and an interior corridor which is working around neurovascular bundles the most important being vessels that is a fundamental absolute principle that you have to understand that the external corridor is almost irrelevant and doesn't really matter the external corridor only determines the site of the incision has cosmesis related to it the morbidity is determined almost exclusively by the internal corridor is that clear okay so we're going to discuss this concept in a minute as i then come do we have a a mic that i can use instead do you have a lapel mic or anything as we come across the ventral skull base there are again just in the interest of repetition there are only four access points to get in in the external corridor anterior medial anterior lateral lateral and posterior lateral right um no thank you when you look at these four and you look at the trajectories what do you notice the anterior lateral lateral and posterior lateral by definition start from the outside and work radially interiorly right whereas the anterior medial starts medially and works radially outward and that's a fundamental advantage that we're going to try and take advantage of as we proceed independent of the corridor that you take there are some guiding principles that you must maintain every single exposure must be by manual you must use two hands you must use microsurgery as the guiding principle of the resection so basically that's countertraction sharp dissection extracapsular that's what we discussed yesterday right your reconstructions must be vascularized in my opinion whenever you can and the selection of the corridor is determined by the patient and the experience of the surgeon so using those guiding principles how do you pick one of those four pathways to get to the tumor and that's really what we're going to talk about now in order for you to pick you must have a decision making tree as to what guides you to select a corridor in my mind there are two primary sources of morbidity and as i pick the corridor based on the internal corridor i really consider the vasculature and the position of the cranial nerve as we discussed yesterday vascular complications are devastating but infrequent and manageable cranial nerve deficits are much more common and so profoundly affect the quality of life and i'm going to take a second as an editorial in the early 90s when we started skull base surgery we were in a world of feasibility where our goal was to just prove that we could get there 
and we sustained some significant cranial nerve neuropathies in association with this, but we accepted that as a part of the procedure because we were taking on tumors that we otherwise weren't. The refinement of any procedure, whether it's cranial nerve or cranial base resection or a gallbladder, is the progressive improvement. After 10 years, it's no longer acceptable to have a facial nerve, or for that matter, a sixth nerve or a third nerve for a skull-based lesion because these are the things that impact the long-term quality of the patients. So based on that, in our experience, if you ask me after 10 years, everything I've done in the first decade of skull-based surgery can be summarized by one simple sentence, which is when possible, not always, but when possible, pick one of the four pathways where you don't have to violate the plane of a nerve. Is that clear? Any, any questions about that? No. Okay. So, we took that data over the last 10 years, and this was the paper that was in the Academy Journal earlier this year, and noted that our incidence of permanent morbidity using that decision-making tree was 1.8% in 800 consecutive cases of skull-based tumors, with a mortality of 0.9, giving us a combined morbidity and mortality of 2.6%. So now let's start. We'll start at 2 and work our way down to 12 and see how we can apply this to cases, okay? All right, so we'll start with this case. What artery, what nerve? Come on, optic nerve? So there's the optic nerve. Artery is the carotid. Are you gonna come medial or lateral? Lateral, straightforward, right? How you come lateral, up to you. You make your decision perional craniotomy, orbitozygomatic osteotomy, or a supralateral eyebrow craniotomy. The reality is the ex that's the exterior corridor, correct? Does it matter? No. It's cosmetics. It's the interior corridor, the position of the optic nerve that will determine whether that patient can see or not, which will actually determine the patient's long-term morbidity, not whether the scar is behind the hairline or in the eyebrow. Okay? So we chose to do uh, a brow craniotomy for this. Why, I'm not sure. Maybe it was just a Monday and that's how we decided. But the exterior corridor is really quite irrelevant in my mind. And there's the post-op. Okay. What artery, what nerve? Optic nerve. And what? Internal carotid. Very good. So there's the optic nerve and there's the internal carotid. Above or below? Why? Right. The reason is because when you come from above, by the way, these are just my opinions. You, you, you don't have to do it this way. These are, this is my thought process. If I come from above, I'm going to work between the optical carotid recess. There's the ipsilateral optic nerve that's ischemic. The window between the carotid and the optic is very small. So I'm going to have to work in that small window. And the relevant artery in this case is the superior hypophyseal artery, which will be on my blind side underneath the nerve which means that in Rudy Falbush's hands, these types of lesions have a 13% incidence of ipsilateral visual deterioration. Whereas if I come from below, you can see the optic chiasm, superior hypophyseal, recurrent optic branch, descending diaphragma, and the subchiasmatic plexus. Nerve is above you, arteries behind you, microdissection, nerve is preserved, vasculature is preserved. And so I choose an endonasal route. Clear? my internal corridor. External corridor, the nose, in order to get there. And that's the post-op. The visual outcome rates for us were for 120 consecutive paracellar meningiomas dropped down to about a 3.5% incidence of visual deterioration. No single patient with normal visual fields lost vision in the entire series in 10 years. The only patients that lost vision were patients that came in with either previous radiation therapy or profound vision loss. And the answer to that was you weren't manipulating an ischemic optic nerve and you were preserving the superior hypophyseal plexus. Okay? So that's that. So what did we learn in the subchiasmatic space? We learned yesterday the importance of the medial optical carotid recess in the dissection. Yesterday we learned the need for small vessel preservation, the most important of which is superior hypophyseal. Okay? Now, that's the sagittal plane. Now let's extend on the optic nerve slightly lateral. 
So when I look at this, and tomorrow if we have time, we'll give a separate lecture on 360 of the orbit, this is what I see. So what artery, what nerve? Optic end? Ophthalmic artery. So in this particular case, the optic nerve is located here. The lesion is medial. Ophthalmic artery is going to be lateral. Above or below? Below, right? If I come below, my internal corridor now is going to go through the nasal passages, lamina papyracea, that's easy. Now I've got to get into the intracoronal space. This muscle is the medial rectus. This is? Right. So now I can create a corridor between rectus and oblique directly in through the fat pad, leaving the nerve medial, never touching it, and resecting the lesion. Does that make sense to you? Okay. So in doing that, this is what our post-op looks like. Now how do I do that in practical perspectives? Sagittal view, carotid artery, cavernous component, optic apparatus, chiasmatic, optic nerve. This artery is the? Ophthalmic. Now remember this. Remember I told you you could move arteries? There's one artery in the head you cannot move. Ophthalmic artery. Why? No, not because it's little. No. 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 Because the central retinal artery comes off about eight millimeters distal to the plexus and it wraps like a corkscrew around the optic nerve. It wraps around it. So if I move the artery here, I'll avulse the central retinal. So the one artery that cannot be moved is the ophthalmic. The ophthalmic artery, fortunately, God gave us a break, doesn't come off exactly at 6 o'clock, comes off slightly paramedian, which means that the mid medial corridors are very available. So in this particular case, to get in, all we do is a retrograde lamina papyracea dissection. So we open up the lamina papyracea, we drill back the clinoid. Remember yesterday, we did a medial OCR isolation and the optics. It's exactly the same view. Once we get inside, this is the view we get. So now here is the right side. That's the posterior ethmoidal artery on that side. We've now decompressed the, the ethmoidal. We now completely decompress the ophthalmic artery and the optic canal. You don't try and move the globe without releasing the nerve. Otherwise, you create a tether point. Once the canal is decompressed, we open up the periorbita, very straightforward. And now we get fat that herniates at us. As the fat herniates at us, we have to manage it. Because we're going to do an intraconal dissection, we let the fat come. Now, how do you manage this? We go back into the eye, and we isolate the medial rectus and inferior oblique. We put vessel loops around that, and we call that puppet strings. So here's a couple of puppet strings. We separate the muscles. Because the muscles are tethered posteriorly, anterior movement is really translated very well posteriorly. So here's the medial rectus, inferior oblique. We create a corridor between the two muscles, and we get a direct view first into the tumor, medially, knowing that the nerve is located laterally. So we can do this entire resection without ever seeing the nerve. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay, so we've used an internal corridor using the divergence principle. Do you understand the principle of divergence that we talked about on the first day? Look, we're really going to use that. So we come back here. Here's a muscle. The annulus of Zinn, the definition of which is confluence of muscles, then diverges as it goes to the target. And we're working in between divergent muscles using the principle of divergence to create an internal corridor. Make sense? Okay, so there's the post-op. I'm very lucky in Ottawa, um, one of my mentors and teachers, uh, Dr. Steve Gilberg, uh, is a very well-known oculoplastic surgeon. So we do a lot of orbital work related to this. So lateral extension, you can go out to the optic canal and up to lamina papyracea. You can do a 270 degree decompression of the canal um, and really can work intraconally. Why 270? Because of the ophthalmic. Okay? 30 days. The gland preservation rate, meaning the function they came in with, is 87.5% because the vasculature is preserved. It's a good question. Everybody winds up with diabetes insipidus during the transposition because it's a lot of posterior gland manipulation. And then after 30 days, the DI settles. Okay, something more interesting for our ENT colleagues. So this is a JNA, right? 
pretty, pretty good size, even for India. Where are the nerves? Sorry? Which artery, which nerve, first of all? Well, there's four arteries. Carotid? IMAX? No. I, I, IMAX is phenopalatine. Ascending pharyngeal? One more. Most important. Vidian. Okay. So four arteries. Carotids are in the back. What nerves? Yeah, three, four, five, six. Right? Mostly three, four, and six. Where will they be? Cavernous sinus. Cavernous sinus. Where will they be? On the outside or the inside of the lesion? Outside. Why? How do you know that? Does the JNA invade dura? No. No, it displaces dura. So the biology of the tumor will dictate the position of the nerve. So in this case, the nerves, I can't tell you where they are right now, except it's a JNA. It's going to be a tumor that's grown from the vidian, and it's going to displace laterally all the lesions. So in this case, you can see the lesions are lateral. Make sense? So how am I going to go? Straight down the middle. Now, the problem here is in a large lesion like this, I've got to segmentalize this based on the arterial supply. So how do I do that? So my choices are an anterior medial or a paramedian approach. I'm going to take advantage of the internal corridor where the nerves are divergent, so I can work between them. I'm going to address this lesion in a series of modules based on the blood supply. In order for me to do that, I have to understand what Rick just taught us. There are four segments of the carotid artery, because it's all about the carotid, right? So here's the parapharyngeal carotid, posterior genu, horizontal, paraclival, and siphon. Does that make sense? Let's do that again. Parapharyngeal, posterior genu, horizontal, anterior genu, paraclival, siphon. Each one of these has a critical landmark, correct? For the parapharyngeal, this structure here marks it. What structure is this? Eustachian tube. tube. Very good. Posterior genu, horizontal. The junction of the horizontal and the paraclival is a saddle. Can you see that? That saddle has a nerve sitting on it like a horseback rider. English, no. Nope. English, English style. Legs here, no. Nope. V2N, very good. So V2N, V3, so that's Meckel's cave. But how do I find the junction of the horizontal and the paraclival? What? No. No. Come on, you know this. So, what? No, Vidian's out here. What nerve is this? Greater superficial petrosal nerve. The greater superficial petrosal nerve meets the deeper petrosal nerve to form the Vidian. So in fact, when I tell you it's the Vidian that takes you to this, the Vidian takes you to the greater superficial petrosal nerve. GSPN crosses the junction of the paraclival and the horizontal. The GSPN starts as a nervous intermedius, runs along the temporal fossa, leaves the temporal fossa underneath V3 in its own foramen called the greater superficial petrosal foramen. Identification of GSPN as identified by the Vidian leads you to the junction of the paraclival and the horizontal carotid, which is the single most important thing in this region. Okay? So we can work underneath the carotid, we call that an infrapetrous approach. We can work medial to the carotid, and we call that a zone one, petrous apex approach. Or we can work in this space between V2, V3, horizontal, and paraclival carotid. And this space is called the quadrangular approach. Okay, and that gets us to Meckel's cave. Or we can work lateral, lateral to the transpterygoid, lateral wall of the lateral pterygoid plate, and that leads us to the infratemporal fossa. Okay? And these are the middle third regions of the coronal plane. So now, here's this large JNA, and you can see it's, it's, it's everywhere, so it becomes a little bit more difficult to manage. So I look at this and I say, well, how can we modulate this based on the blood supply? using that scheme that I just showed you. So the first thing we look at and we say, okay, the interventionalists can get rid of the IMAX, right? And they can get rid of the ascending pharyngeal. I'm left with the carotid and the video. So when I look at this, my first target in this particular case is going to be the video. 
the quicker I can get to the vidian, the faster I can stop this from bleeding. Okay? So how do I find the vidian? And that's what I'm going to show you on the next couple of slides. So once I get the vidian, I can then go out lateral because the sphenopalatine is taken. I can then go up because the sphenopalatine and the IMAX are taken. I can then go all the way into the infratemporal fossa because the IMAX is gone. I can then go down into the nasopharyngeal space because the ascending pharyngeal is taken and go out laterally. And then the last thing I want to do is to remove the component that's in the cavernous sinus because that's where I'll get the venous bleeding. So you create this large lesion and you modulate it, knowing the nerves around the perimeter and you address it with a series of uh, modules based on the position of the arteries, the most important being the vidian. So how do we find the vidian? Between 10 and 2. So if the lesion is between 10 and 2, I should be able to get it straight down the middle. Okay? So let's look at this tumor. This is below the VBJ. So is the 6th nerve a concern? No. Where does the 6th nerve originate? Above the VBJ. This lesion is now below, medial to 10 and medial to 2. So it's between the two 12th nerves. Here's 12. Here's 12. So I should be able to get this straight down the middle. So to do this, it's slightly eccentric on the left. I'm going to need a little more left exposure. So here's the basion. Here's the frame and magnum. So if I were to draw the 12th nerves here, they would be here at 10 o'clock and here at 2 o'clock. So this lesion is completely in between. I can now isolate the basion. There's the apical ligament. And what you're looking at here is the joint. That joint right here is like the hip joint. That's how the spine stays on the, on the head. It's the hip joint. So here's the acetabulum, and there's the hip. So this is the occipital condyle, and there's a superior articular facet of one. I can't violate that joint, otherwise I'm going to wind up unstable. I've taken it slightly eccentric to the left, because the tumor goes eccentric to the left, and I need control of the vertebral artery. Once I've done that, I then coagulate the midline, finish the coagulation in the midline, open the midline completely, open the dura propria, and once I've opened the midline, look at the view that we get. Here's the midline open. So here's the left vert, right vert, and I'm in the VBJ, right? Right in between. So then I coagulate the surface of the tumor, and look at the technique. It's microsurgery. Bipolar, suction, scissors, internal debulking, and start to mobilize the tumor. Okay, so now what do I see? This is an interesting view. It's the vertebral. Well, that's the easy answer. This is the vertebral. So what's this? No. Nope. Cervical. C1 rootlets ventral to the vert. So what's this? Dentate ligament. This is the 11th nerve. Okay, so look what's happened. I've worked completely in a point of divergence between the nerves. I'm ventral to the nerve. I haven't crossed the rootlet of C1, haven't crossed the dentate, haven't crossed the vert, and haven't crossed the 11th. Whereas any other approach, I would have to cross each of those nerves to get to those, that tumor. Does that make sense to everybody? Here's the rootlet of C1. And now you can actually see, there's the anterior spinal artery, and you're looking at really C1, C2 spinal cord from the front. Here's the final resection, C1 rootlets, vert, dentate, and 11. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? So it's a midline approach. Okay, what artery, what nerve? What artery? Vertebral. What nerve? Which one? 12. Where's 12 going to be? At the 10 and 2 o'clock position. So it's going to be here. Through the nose or open? Open. Because coming through the nose, I have to cross 12. Do I need some sophisticated far lateral approach? No. This is a simple juxtacondylar approach from behind, proximal to the 12th nerve, because I don't have to cross the nerve. Does that make sense? Okay.
I think everybody has probably had just about enough for now. Let me um, kind of sum up here. So what did we learn? What I learned was doesn't matter what approach I do, I have to use two hands. We learned that doesn't matter what approach you use, you got to use microsurgery. I learned that doesn't matter what approach I use, I have to reconstruct with a vascularized pedicle. I learned that the approach that you take really depends upon the corridor, the patient's anatomy, and my own personal experience. So based on that, um, when I see the skull base, this is what I see. How do you summarize everything that we just talked about? When I look in the midline at the level of the cella, <coughs> what artery and what nerve come in the way? Carotids and optic. So if I'm going to go in the cella, what approach are we going to take? An endonasal approach. When I look at the region of the anterior skull base, what artery and what nerve? The optic and the anterior cerebrals. So if the lesion is below the optics and underneath the frontal lobe, I'm generally going to go into nasal. When I look in the region of the clivus, what artery and what nerve? Sixth nerve. Right? And the carotid. So if the lesion is between six nerves and the carotids, I'm going to go into nasal. When I look at the frame in magnum, what artery, what nerve? Twelfth nerves. If the lesion is between the 12th nerves, I'm going to go into nasal. So you can see that the first half of my life has been fairly disappointing because I've told you if the tumor is in the middle, I'm going to come down the middle. It's not very interesting, right? When we look at the paramedian planes, the paramedian planes can be divided from anterior to posterior as an anterior, middle, and posterior compartment, correct? The anterior compartment is really the orbit, the box of the orbit, remember? The box of the maxilla and the nasopharynx. When I look in the orbit, what artery and what nerve? Optic and ophthalmic. So now it gets a little more interesting. So there's your optic nerve going out. The orbit is a very, very interesting compartment. When I look at the orbit, and if the lesion is medial to the optic nerve, am I going to come Maybe. It depends if it's posterior or anterior. If the lesion is in the posterior compartment, I'm going to come endonasally because it's a great point of divergence that I can work in between, like that meningioma I showed you. But if the lesion is anterior, why would I come through the nose and then out the conjunctiva? That makes no sense. So if it is medial to the optic nerve and anterior, I'm going to do a transconjunctival incision. If it's lateral, supralateral orbitotomy. In the middle cranial fossa, what artery and what nerve? Right, the trigeminal system. Okay. If the lesion is medial to the trigeminal, we're going to come endonasal. If it's lateral, I'm going to do an infratemporal. In the posterior cranial fossa, if the lesion is medial to the hypoglossal or jugular foramen, I'll generally come in the nasal. If it is lateral, I'm going to do a posterior lateral approach. So basically, the last 14 years of skull base surgery, this is what we've learned. It's a very simple, kind of straightforward approach. A lot of math behind it. Goes, gets a little confusing, but fairly embarrassing. All that math and experience you can summarize into one sentence. And, and the person that knows this better than anybody else is my 11-year-old son um, who will tell you that you shouldn't cross a nerve. Okay. Any questions? I'm sure there has to be some questions. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
Not, not usually. In most acoustics that grow in this direction, they actually displace 9 and 10 inferior, caudal. Two, if we see the extension into the internal mechanism, mm -hmm. it's almost reaching up to the fundus. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you ask a good question, is the lateral extension, because you're out, as you say, to the fundus, you're actually almost out to the ampulla. Um, it doesn't bother me to drill the superior semicircular canal. That's really not too much of a concern. You can't put a telescope into that. The bigger issue I have is that the alternative to a retrosigmoid approach is a translab here. I wouldn't do a translab on this patient, because it's a relatively high jugular bulb. So to reach the lower caudal extent, I'm not going to debate it, I'm just telling you that I've done them a lot of different ways. If that's how you choose to do it, that's okay. Um, for me, because of the vertical extension, particularly related to the lower segment near the jugular foramen, for this particular lesion, even mobilizing the jugular ball below, you can certainly do that. Um, it's, for me, uh, it's, it's going to be a lot more manipulation, whereas a straight retrosigmoid approach here is actually quite easy. Uh, I'm going to land directly on the tumor. 9 and 10 are going to be displaced down, 5 is going to be displaced up. My point of divergence in the